Hi, I'm Marge Charmley. Welcome to Bi Cities, a program by, for, and about the bisexual community and our friends and allies. If you're just tuning in, Bi Cities is the longest running television show in the history of the world on bisexuality. And if you have tuned in before, welcome back. We'd love to have you here. Tonight, my lovely co-host, Dr. Anita Kozan, is unable to be with us, but the golden voice and the golden mane of Bi Cities will be back shortly, so stay tuned. Tonight, we have a guest with us who started life as a major, probably didn't start life that way, but became a major in the United States Army and served our country well during that period and eventually came back to the Bi Cities of Minneapolis-St. Paul and became the founder, CEO, and president of Lavender Media. We're very pleased to have Stephen Rockford on our show tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Mark. You forgot one thing. I also empty the garbage and mop up occasionally. Oh, well, then you can help us after the show. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have that part of your title, but we can run it across on the ribbon if you like. Oh, that's all right. It's better <laughs> okay. to have a surprise for people. Yeah. Well, you know, when I, I met you a while back, and you know, just in passing, so you may not have remembered that, but it was when Anita Kozan was one of the Pride recipients mm -hmm. uh, of Lavender Pride a couple of years ago. And I bet a lot of people, the average person, I was surprised to learn of your storied career in the military. Uh, well, I served the country for 12 years, yes. and uh, I spent uh, four of it in Germany, and I used to sit atop my tank and wave at the Russians across the border uh, a couple of kilometers away. <laughs> and they used to, <laughs> you know, with their binoculars and look at me and they'd wave back, you know, that sort of thing. But I did a number of other th jobs and uh, it was an interesting time. And you once had your finger on the button, as you said. The, uh... Uh, I was what they called a nuclear release authentication system officer. So I did have my finger on a button. I sat in a room uh, with a 45 under my arm uh, bars on the windows, uh, bulletproof door, and I had many safes and uh, uh, all the communications equipment in the world, more than you've got in your studio, and I could talk to just about anybody. Wow. And you read everything. I mean, you were kind of the last step before the president got to read some of this. I had a U.S. NATO top secret and flash clearance, which meant I read just short of the president, I, practically everything. Wow. So when we spoke earlier this week, you talked about yourself as being an avid student of history and kind of one of those rare individuals that <laughs> reminds me of the, the Greek god Janus, who is, looks backward and forward at the same time. So you've been able to use your knowledge and your passion for history and use it as a visionary in terms of predicting the future. And that was something you did in the military, but perhaps importantly to us today. You're doing that with Lavender Media. I am. Uh, yes. When I started the publication, I had a vision of uh, where the community was, where it had been, and what I thought uh, the direction it should go. And so I geared Lavender toward meeting those goals and putting it in a, in a direction that I thought would provide the greatest service to make the necessary uh, transitions that we had to do as a community. So you were number 13 in terms of gay, lesbian, bi, and transgender publications here in the Twin Cities or Bi Cities of Minneapolis-St. Paul. You learned from your predecessors. The numbers 1 through 10 had already gone out of business. Numbers 11 and 12, the first one started in November of 1978. And the first 10 were all gone uh, and bankrupt by 92. And then number 11 started in 92 and number 12 started in 93. And then I started Lavender two years later, uh, number 13. And uh, since that time, um, numbers 14 through 31 have all started and uh, failed as well. So you are it. Essentially, yes. Essentially, yes. So Somebody will always come along, uh -huh. and that's all right. It uh -huh. keeps you on your toes. Yes, yes, exactly. Competition is good. That's the American way. It is, it is. What did you do differently? Why, why has lavender prevailed when others have failed? I'm a historian. That's my love and passion of life. And I can do stand-up comedy. 
because I, I practically have a photographic memory for obscure details that sil people do silly things all throughout history. It isn't just today when you watch the news. History is replete with examples of people doing dumb things. And so I decided, <coughs> uh, looking at what I thought the community needed, and I used the examples of history uh, to guide me in doing a different way and a different approach. For example, uh, I geared Lavender more to the economics of the middle class. And I, the middle class was not really out in our community. Uh, it may have been starting, but it wasn't really out. And so by creating a publication like Lavender, um, which I'm, I think is a first-rate publication in the country, and the other editors of publications around the country say the same. Um, Lavender is something we can be very proud of. It reaches a great many people. It lays a good impression on people. And it helped uh, bring out the middle class, I think. And we have so many advertisers uh, in, in our publication. Um, we bring a lot of dollars to those advertisers. And over the years, there's been another point that I wanted to do eventually. I wanted more and more straight people to advertise to reach the gay market. Again, the interactions of gay people coming to their businesses after seeing their ad in Lavender helps change the perceptions yes. and breaks down the barriers. And we make one convert at a time in business. So it's, there's all kinds of effects. I did it. I did it more along a business line and a business model because I perceive economics to be the keystone of evolution. And I am convinced that that is more effective. Well, you told me some things about Lavender that I was surprised to hear in terms of the educational level of the readership, the income level. There are things that are stunning about, and, and all the awards that <laughs> you've garnered over the years. So tell us a little bit about those. Well, the awards, uh, the Minnesota Magazine and Publications Association, the MMPA, we've won 60 awards in 10 years. and. Uh, uh, every year we've won an award. Uh, now we're in competition. It's a nonprofit that evaluates all 500 publications produced in the state. And Lavender has won the best publication in the state uh, three times in 10 years against all those competing publications. And I mean Minnesota Monthly, Minneapolis. We have won third place three times. And our website has been in the top three every year. And uh, uh, articles, covers, artwork, photography, you name it. Uh, types of articles, columns, editorials. Uh, we've won a, quite a good gamut. We have a well-written uh, publication designed and laid out, and it's been recognized by our peers. Uh, the second thing is, I think, um, we We've kept up, well, actually, we've led in technology. And I think that was essential to do many of the things that I thought we needed to do. Uh, we started our website in 97. Uh, we're the first gay publication in the country to have a digital magazine some years ago. We're the first gay publication to uh, have an app uh, for your iPad. And uh, we are also number one on Twitter for anything gay or lesbian in the United States. So, uh, and we've got some surprises coming very shortly. You'll, there'll be a big surprise, another one. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. You were showing me some of the symbols. This is uh, the issue of lavender that's out now. Mm -hmm. And I really wasn't fully attuned to that, to be honest with you. So perhaps you could share with us, and maybe if you guys can give us a, a close up here. Number one, the first thing here, we have a little symbol and this uh, shows that we recycle every issue. It's something I've done since day one. So when you see copies of Lavender out on the stands, they're picked up. We track them by computer at each of our almost 1,000 locations in the metro area. So we know exactly how many copies are picked up and how many are left over. So we call out excess and acquire a new site without producing more. 
and when certain things affect that, weather and so forth, but we recycle every copy. So lavender is green. We are, we've been green since mm -hmm. 1995. Wow. We've done that. And we have, I won't mention our competitors, but uh, uh, some of the other free publications in this town have had as much as 40% wastage rates mm. because they're cheap to produce, but lavender is not cheap to produce. It's high quality paper inside and out. And so I want to keep the costs down and I, I believe in recycling. So we do that and I can distribute more and more, track the usage and make sure if we're not putting enough copies, we'll increase the load and so forth. The other thing here is, here is our iPad app. And if this is scanned, the younger people that watch your show can see this they can get the entire mag digital magazine online. And here's the app symbol for that. Over here is Twitter, and this issue says 28,780 people uh, there we go. use us, read us on Twitter. And uh, it's phenomenal the number of things that we've been able to do over the years. So I think that covers just about everything. Uh, we try to do a, a good job with the limited resources that we have and uh, help the community out. Now, I had a friend that uh, spent some time a few years ago in the Castro in San Francisco and said that he saw Lavender Magazine in one of the bookstores there. Now, do you distribute that widely? We did at the time. Uh -huh. uh, the bookstore went out of business. <laughs> and uh, 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 there were some transformations, but we've been, we've, we are in f essentially a five-state area in the upper Midwest, but we're in some other locations, and we distribute to ad agencies and so forth in the leading towns uh, in the country. So who would you say um, are your competitors on the national level? Well, there's really nothing like us. Uh, we are the, I don't want to sound arrogant, but there's really nothing like us. There's one in Phoenix that is uh, similar in nature. They're all glossy. Uh, but as far as local publications, there isn't really much. Uh, some of the national publications are like us, uh, but there are very few. There, were, we, there are 133 gay publications, I believe, in the United States, and we track 80 of them. The rest are too small. Mm -hmm. um, and there isn't really anything to compare with us. Uh, we were nominated at a national convention of editors as the best local, locally produced publication in the United States some years ago. And we've gotten significantly better. You have uh, been at the head of the pack here in terms of, uh, again, your vision, your vision. And I can't wait to see what else is uh, coming down the road here. You also talked about Lavender is available, or big gay news, in 12 languages. We have two podcasts. Uh -huh. uh, one is called Wanda Wisdom, which is a comedic show. And it's a sober drag queen. And if you took a look at the guy that does it, we have our studio in our basement. And he's about six foot four. And you know, he's like this. But you can just see him uh, you know, in his wig on and so forth. But he calls the studio his boudoir. And he does his comedic show, and he gets, you know, a quarter million downloads a month. And then he does the other one, which is Big Gay News. Mm -hmm. And Big Gay News, I told him, you're going to do it like Walter Cronkite. No joking, no kidding around. You're going to read the news, no tonal inflection. It's professional. And uh, we get about a quarter million downloads on that as well a month. And we do it in 12 languages, and we're the only gay publication that has that in the world that we've found. And we've and been doing it a number of years. Yes. Nobody's figured out how we do it just yet. And, and that's uh, proprietary information, which we will not discuss today. You're right, we won't. <laughs> Thank you. You must be awfully proud. I'm proud of the people that have gone into making it what it is. We donate to 63 nonprofits in the community in excess of six figures a year. And that's a significant amount for a small company like us. I'm, uh, some people might say I'm anally retentive when it comes to the finances. I keep a tight grasp of that and changing economic circumstances, I have an MBA. Mm -hmm. And I read economics several hours a day. 
So I also am a futurist, and I'm looking to the future, not only technologically, but economically, politically. And, and I see a lot of different things coming, and I want to position Lavender to be there to serve the community in the manner it needs to be served for the future. You could have taken your talents, your acumen in many directions. How, what brought you to back to the Twin Cities and to the GLBT community? And you could have done a lot of other things. Well, um, good heavens, I don't know. Why does any one of us <laughs> go down any path that we go down? Uh, a door opened and I walked through it and I went, okay, and I just kept walking. And I'm not concerned about what happens uh, uh, if, if uh, uh, we go national someday, and that's been discussed uh, over the several years, um, we might do something along those lines. Uh, uh, I'm a very precise person, so I like to make sure that all my ducks are in order. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I could end up, uh, I may tire of this one day and just go wash dishes. I always joke that I would wash dishes at a place that's now out of business called the uh, New Riverside Co-op. New Riverside Cafe at Cedar Riverside. I always liked that place. It was full of artists. And uh, uh, I thought I would take several years out to do dishes in the co-op. Uh, but uh, uh, because the place was a plethora of material, believe me, the people in that, yeah, just yeah. sitting there having a, a piece of strudel and a, and a cup of coffee, watching the people in the place was just delightful. And I thought I could do that, but I didn't. And, and so my path went a different direction, and I'm going to go wherever the flow takes me, and I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about, you know, the, the economics as being uh, the cornerstone of so much. You were talking about the revenue or the advertising, the, the $8 billion that... Uh, we are, uh, there is a company... Uh, that does, uh, there are two major companies in the United States. The biggest one is called uh, International Demographics. And what they do is they track uh, media, television, radio, and print in the largest 27 markets in the United States. The Twin Cities, obviously, is one of those. Uh, they came to me because Lavender had been on their radar for several years before. And when they flew somebody up to talk to me, uh, that woman showed me a CD-ROM that had all the statistical data from huge amounts of market research. And uh, out of 100 business categories was number one in the Twin Cities in 38 out of 100 business categories and 25 more we were second or third place. So 63 out of 100 business categories we were in the top three. Little tiny lavender. And when we looked at the statistics for income of the readership and the education level, we were by far and away the first place winner, a lowly second place, way behind us by, as I recall, about 20% was Minnesota Monthly. Number three was Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine, and they were 18% below Minnesota Monthly. So when you look at the yawning gap in numbers, it was just startling to me because I knew we were good in several areas, but the statistical analysis that I could acquire with my limited resources was not enough for me to be accurate in making pronouncements. I just knew we were good. Our income, uh, the average reader is almost exactly $90,000 per person, not per household. And the education level, uh, we are like three times the average uh, for those that have a college degree. So there are a lot of the community, um, it shows our economic wealth and power. And some people try to discount that, but I've got the statistics that show our readership. It's over $8 billion locally, the income of our readers. The income is over $8 billion. $8 billion right here in this market. Wow. Statistically, the Twin Cities is the 16th largest metropolitan area in the United States with about 3.3 million people. But we have statistically the eighth 
largest gay, lesbian, bi, transgender community in the country. So that's, that's a amazing. numbers, not percentage. That, no, that's in percentage. Percentage, okay. Percentage. We're not in numbers. They're obviously bigger cities sure. like New York and Chicago. Yeah, but percentage-wise, and that's startling to people that we have such a large percentage, and it's because of the economic foundation in this state, in this area. It's a, we have laws to protect people in housing and employment, and those draw people here. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So when this woman came to you with all this data, mm -hmm. were you shocked? Stunned. Stunned. And I'm a numbers guy. Yeah, yeah. Believe me. And, and when I saw, I sat watching that CD-ROM for about two and a half hours. And I don't think I said more than three or four words the whole time. I just focused as she clicked the thing and went on to the next slide, so to speak. And I was just absolutely stunned. So it was beyond, in some ways, your wildest imagination. I couldn't have imagined anything that strong. I just knew we were good in several areas. The degree to which we were strong was phenomenal. There's nothing like us in the country. And you are also the world's largest producer of gay news. Yes, and uh, the Big Gay News podcast, uh, we do in 12 languages, and if I try to read them off for you, <laughs> I, I hope I get them all right. There's English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, German, uh, Czech, Russian, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Mandarin, not Cantonese, and Thai. So we do those markets. Wow. How did you choose those particular markets? Any, or is that there, proprietary well, as well? Well, there's but, you know. obvious reasons. If you look at the demographics of each of those countries. I wouldn't have thought of com Thailand, for com example. Computer usage. All right, gotcha. And education. Uh -huh. Where would you like to be with lavender in five years? Oh, good heavens. <laughs> I don't know. I have ideas that I can see permutations, a number uh -huh. of which are dependent upon circumstances beyond my control and some within. So to tell you where I would like to be, I don't think I'd tell you exactly what's on my mind, uh -huh. uh, proprietary information yes, yes, being yes. what it is. I can see a number of different things that could happen. Uh, I was seriously approached by people to take it national. and. Uh, I did not think that the economics were there just yet. Mm -hmm. Some people have tried to buy it. Well, a lot of people have tried to buy it. And again, I, they weren't, uh, they're bankrupt now. And you aren't, and not only are you not bankrupt, but you're, you're not in debt with this magazine, no which debt. is uh, pretty exceptional in this day and age and climate. And I pre prepared for the recession starting in 2005. And I started executing it in 2007 with updates in six. And uh, by the time the recession hit in September of 2008, um, when the stock market crashed, we were well positioned to do what I thought was necessary to survive. So we're not going anywhere. You'll be here for a while. Oh, yes. I have plans. You know, we have this big issue coming up here in Minnesota with the uh, constitutional amendment mm -hmm. and there's no doubt that Lavender will be involved with that. What, what do we need to do in your opinion to, to win this one? Well, many people will scream and yell at me for what I will say, but I'm convinced I'm a historian. I used to teach history and I think uh, uh, Statistically, in spite of a poll that came out this morning, that poll, I believe, was predicated on all uh, voters as opposed to likely voters. Mm -hmm. And the statistical difference there is striking. So I don't believe that it would win as currently, uh, I be excuse me, our side won't win, uh -huh. I don't think, in spite of that poll. And here's why I think that. I think that the word marriage is an obstacle. Mm 
And while it is very emotive for people from our side of the house to say we want that, and I would agree that we should have it, I would say that to Mr. and Mrs. America, Fred Neffel from Onamia, Minnesota, that the word marriage uh, brings different things to mind. And what I think uh, is our failure is to identify history is on our side. We will win. It's a question of when. And uh, I know enough history to know you go two steps forward and one step back. And then you go two steps forward and one step back. So we're always making progress, not as much as you and I may like. But if we remove the word marriage and it was substituted for civil union or something else, it would be much easier to pass. And here's why. Fred Neffel, as I mentioned earlier, believe, and, and, and most Americans believe marriage is an institution of God and their denomination of religion. And it isn't. It's a function of state. Uh, and I can prove it. Uh, the, the ministers, rabbis, priests, and uh, Muslim imams in the state of Minnesota cannot perform a marriage ceremony without a license issued by the state. Therefore, it's a function of state, and it's not about procreation. It is about property, inheritance, and the transference of assets. And thank you. Stephen Rockford for being on By Cities. Thank you for all that you do Thank you. in the GLBT community. Thank you. And if you would join me in our signature goodbye. Bye, Bye. for now.